And you stay, please. And we're going to ask our last speaker, Bernard Aragones, who has worked mostly in Europe, the US, India, Mexico, and Brazil. His experience includes editing feature films, miniseries, documentaries, TV ads, and large format IMAX productions. He supervised digital effects for over 20 projects and with co-productions which have taken him to all over the place. So somehow our finale for Interdocs today is not so much interactive, it is uh, immersive and virtual reality, but we're with two people who are experts, I believe I've got it right, in post-production. Uh, yesterday we talked about motion graphics, different rotoscopy, but uh, these two people talk about post-production. They are experts at that and we're going to finish this uh, afternoon session when we are running late but it was only to be expected with uh, these two people and a uh, little surprise that we have for the very last thing. So good afternoon my name is Bernat Aragonés, um, editor and sound supervisor. In the brief uh, uh, time that uh, I have, I'd like to share with you our vision of virtual reality at Antaviana, particularly for storytelling, for documentary storytelling. Our view comes from recent experiences, productions that uh, we've finished in the last few years, last few months, or on which we are working, and it also comes from our sort of longer term experience uh, which comes from at the beginning of the 20 of the noughties with uh, the IMAX productions, Omnimax, 2D and stereoscopic animation films and then things like Chico Rita and Tadeo Jones, which was stereoscopic. And for us, the evolution of stereoscopy is what takes us to virtual reality. There is this continuous spectrum. There is a mutation, an evolution, but a continued relationship. All of us who were doing stereoscopy a few years ago are now working on virtual reality. And uh, what we're doing is fed from our work on special effects. For example, Isabel Couchet's film, which we worked on a couple of years ago, where we had to recreate the North Pole, which played a huge role in the film. And I think that what really defines us is this combination of creativity, language, and technology. And it is in this field where virtual reality well, really calls for this kind of knowledge and, and skills and talents. We'd say that what's virtual is what has an apparent existence, what's not real. And then reality is what is actual and effective, the real and effective existence of something. So this is a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? An oxymoron is a paradoxical uh, union of antithetic terms. An oxymoron is basically extreme madness. The tension between the two elements of the paradigm is uh, like an anarchist bunker or a journey to nowhere. But uh, nevertheless, I will use the definition of virtual reality, which is perhaps the most practical one, and it's this, the representation of uh, uh, images or scenes or pictures of objects which is produced by a computer system and creates the uh, illusion of real existence. So we're kind of hacking our senses to make them believe into a reality which is IT produced and our senses just buy it and think it's real. Virtual reality nevertheless has a long uh, technological story. We could talk about Charles 
Wheatstone, mid 19th century, and the first stereoscopes. And then developed in the 20th century in weird and wonderful forms, some of which actually bore fruit, such as Edwin Lynx uh, with his first flight simulator. Nowadays, Lynx simulators is a pioneer in virtual sport, virtual based training. In the first decade of the 21st century, we saw a winter of virtual reality, but that was more to do with the creation of contents rather than pure research or technologic development, for which it was actually quite fruitful, and it has given us the whole body of knowledge on which we are riding this huge tsunami wave of technologies and products related to virtual reality. Now, I'm saying virtual reality, but perhaps we should say virtual realities, because uh, we have coined a single term for various experiences. If we talk about the virtual continuum, virtuality continuum, which was from goes from real reality to uh, virtual elements, we have a whole uh, combined line which gives us different experiences. Now, if we just stick to virtual reality uh, something which is immersive and allows for interaction, we can see different experiences. The basic one would be look around, where you're, you can choose your point of view, but you can only rotate your head. Rather than virtual reality, it's just an immersive presentation in 360. Then. The second stage is the lean around stage, where you can, if you move your head, not just turn it, but move it, you can look around an object. So you are within an stereoscopic environment. The previous one could also be stereoscopic, but this one is stereoscopic and you can shift your head, move your head, and you have perception of uh, uh, object occlusion. Move around is a third stage. You can stand up and move around. Uh, and walk around, there is a, a mistake on the screen, I'm sorry. Walk around, not only can you move, but you can interact through different kinds of gadgets. So, we find a whole continuum of virtual realities that we use a single term virtual reality for, but I'm sure that we will see different terms for each of these different modalities because they call for different languages. Now, where we are at, mostly the, the boom of virtual reality with a, a smartphone or virtual reality with a web environment, we are basically at the look around stage, the first stage. Rather than considering it a limited stage or a transition stage, I think it is a really interesting, uh, fruitful for the development of a language. And it is within the field of documentary where we are seeing fascinating initiatives for this. Now, we're going to see, well, uh, we're going to focus on this initial stage, look around, and uh, we're going to see how we have cinematic experiences, linear experiences mostly, linear storytelling experiences, based on an immersive 360 presentation. We've seen an evolution. There was an initial technological stage with acquisition technologies based on standard cameras 
then pool together, creating a kind of hive uh, to make the 360. But that was uh, a kind of uh, complex, tedious stage to handle something that uh, we all were looking forward to just getting over it. We are now at a second generation of cameras. There's a different concept. There's a single camera with multi-view capture. A single camera captures different views. So the settings controls for different sensors, mm, parameter optimization for things like, uh, I don't know, synchronicity of, uh, I don't know, opening sensitivity. It's more, it's better for the kind of, uh, of situations where you are in a 360 uh, environment. It's already been said that immersive uh, presentation or virtual reality is the anti-cinema because you can't frame, you can't focus, you can't light, you can't move the camera, you can't even be there. I mean, it's happened to me. You're filming, you all have to go away, and in the end, in, we find that a cat slipped into the, the scene, and, and we only found out at the very end. But then, thinking about it, you reach the conclusion that that's not really the case. You do frame, you do place the camera, and you choose the height, and you choose the place, and you choose how it relates to the, the objects and the characters. So the, the observer frames. Of course, it, he or she frames. That is the, the, the field of vision, and if you have characters in a dialogue here, here, or here, or here, and here, and here, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to have to correct the framing, and, and you could end up being blamed for many neck aches, depending on how you sort it out. So there is framing, and yes, you, of course you can light. I mean, you may not to redo it, depending on the development of production, but why not? Of course you can have some lights or, or they, they might be hidden or you can't move the camera. Well, why not? And you might even, perhaps you should be there, perhaps you should be there to guide the user. So there is a certain contradiction when you want to place somebody in an invisible space. Sorry, hang on, hang on, hang on. When you want to place somebody somewhere to give it an immersive experience, but you are fighting to do it in a kind of invisible manner. There is then this contradiction where you see sort of half-hidden sticks. And uh, mm, I don't know, I don't know, I'm thinking out loud, but perhaps an option might be to turn things around and you're there guiding the user. And you guide their gaze, look here, look there, look back. You might be the, 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 the guide, why not? I think virtual reality is just so new that we have to learn. Of course we've been learning so far. We've learned that there are things that are just harder to digest, I don't know, sudden movements. Of course, since you don't move, really, but the camera does move, that generates a, a certain sensorial imbalance which might make you dizzy. There are ways to sort it out. If you have something in the a close-up which focuses the movement of the camera, you diminish this dizziness that uh, might be caused by this autonomous movement, or the height of the camera that has already been discussed. And, uh, and particularly for documentaries, I think that there is so much room for experimentation. I think it's absolutely fascinating and such fun. Now, for uh, post-production tools. I think that we are now at a second wave. We've been over the initial off-the-shelf plug-in tools which allow you to do the stitching or processing certain doc contents for certain cameras and you can now integrate uh, VR uh, post-production modules for 
I don't know, color, for example, this Mysticate, which helps correct color and composition in a very powerful manner. I certainly use it. And uh, it allows me, it gives me to, it lets me work on a uh, square frame, which is 360, but then it allows me to work on it on a square presentation and therefore be a bit finer or have uh, uh, titles on a 3D space. So we are certainly advancing, we are making headway in technology and we are moving on with our language, which is at the end of the day, the challenge. And that's that. No, that's it, I'm done. Okay, I'll be brief because I don't have an awful lot of time. I think that the main thing is to share with you my experience from a technical point of view, uh, focused on a kind of production like documentaries, obviously. Let me start with what's been most popular now for 360. I start with a little reflection, thinking of what's been done in the States, we can say that we are kind of two years, a year and a half behind the States. We look at them and we can tell what we have to do over the next year. What's most popular now is things like uh, concerts, Coachella for example, uh, is uh, really going for 360 concerts. McCartney also has done part of his tour three in 360, MTV as well. Sports, definitely something that has already been mentioned, diving, flying, uh, all sorts. It, it, it is fun just being on top of the car, on top of the plane and living what they're living. There are very interesting documentaries or pseudo or documentaries. For example, Discovery has set up a kind of VR department with a considerable budget and so have National Geographic. And it's kind of uh, 360 YouTube contents, which is well, very, very popular now. I'd like to talk about Google. It's quite surprising. They have created a kind of platform. It's not very clear when you go and see them. It's called, uh, their site is Spotlight Story and they are going for 360 productions. I suggest you look at, you watch this, help. Okay, we won't discuss the story or the aesthetics or anything. I'll just look at the making of. It is absolutely amazing how they have found technological solutions for an initial uh, audiovisual uh, 360 storytelling with special effects, uh, 3D. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, I strongly suggest you look at it. It is very expensive. They have developed their own software. They've got four cameras together. They, I mean, you've got they've got engineers to develop specific software to see the video in real time while they could while they were filming in 360 that's a huge challenge and uh, uh, i do encourage you to look at it because i think it is up there with the very best so in the world of documentaries obviously we have to opt for something slightly easier and cheaper on that, I'll talk about cameras later, but there are relatively inexpensive systems for 360 recording. And then we have this. This is something else. This is a different kettle of fish altogether. Now, something else I've seen, I haven't read many analyses of this, is all these different platforms. I can just tell you my honest opinion. I hope there are no Americans in the room, but Americans are expert at finding strategies and monetizing contents. They are ace at that. And what we see now is that they are kind of, there are different uh, companies uh, 
popping up mushroom in trying to uh, cover these contents. We have uh, Google BRSC. If you can look at them, because uh, Chris Milk is behind it. They are generating 360 contents, which is really good quality, and uh, and the, the creation, the imagination is amazing. They're even doing videos, and they've got dedicated apps. This kind of points to me that the strategy is that we should download their app, we should look at their content, and somehow they're going to monetize their contents through advertising or whatever. That's more or less what's happening. Uh, 360 cannot be done by everybody. We have these two different levels, very cheap and uh, top of the range. But the question at the moment is what's happening to the content, who's ruling? Another platform is Jont, another portal, a dedicated part for Android and iPhone. And uh, some uh, produce, some buy, but that's where things are at at the moment. Now, in terms of technology, some of these things have already been mentioned, but briefly. We see Rico, one of the cameras, which is about $250. They can do photo and video 360, and it's a very small camera, very, little, very low resolution, very limited. And then the other side of the coin is Nokia high resolution, and EGM, which is six GoPros put together. I'll discuss it in a minute. But anyway. We are uh, in the infancy of this technology. I would rather work on, the, on what we are telling rather than the tools we're using to tell it. Google, in their making of, talk about different technologies to solve it, but yeah, that's kind of NASA. It's absolutely huge amounts that they are dedicating to it. There are different softwares, Video Stitch or Power Video, which are software for this kind of stitching procedure. Something important is for camera operators or photo directors, when you work in 360, you have six cameras. If you don't use a system which synchronizes all six cameras, you have to do it yourself. Through software, it's kind of fiddly. We even thought we should use uh, the clack, which is um, absurd, but I mean, at least you have a clack and you synchronized all six micros or, um, on uh, microphones and you don't go crazy. But then, if one camera fails, they all fail. With MSF, we also suffered because we knew that if a camera went down, bye bye 360. And GoPro have a sh very short battery life, it's ridiculous. So, we had to work with external batteries. I mean, it looked like a nuclear bomb you know, that little ball with six cables and all sorts of paraphernalia around it. So it's kind of complex. It is kind of inexpensive. It appears to be easy, but the smallest mistake is chaos. It's disaster. You cannot fix it in post-production. Stitching, that is, this is what it looks like. You put the six cameras together, any error is disaster. And then there is post-production. So sometimes we're asked, so how much is it to do a, a 360 video? Well, it's like anything else. At the end of the day, it's a camera. You rent it, you set it up, record with the remote control. You have to run away because you can't be in the frame, and that's it. No? And then post-production, you have to solve glitches. In MSF, I don't know whether you saw, you saw the projected shadow of the tripod with the ball. I mean, yeah, it would be great uh, to be able to record at the golden... Uh, a golden hour, but that would be awful for 360 because you would have a really long shadow. It's hard to get rid of the tripod. And post-production is just more complex than a normal project. And as I was saying before, the editing is completely different. And finally, uh, viewing. YouTube 360 is the most popular way of going about it with a PC Mac or a smartphone. You can see a 360 video, but then you have the, well, Google's uh, kind of joke of these cardboard glasses. I think it is a kind of uh, intention statement saying this is here to stay and you don't need to spend the earth to do it. Obviously, Samsung or Oculus are better than Google, but uh, at the end of the day, it's got to be affordable for everybody or else it doesn't make sense. Or 
it then it has to be something really, really special and, and detailed, like what we did with MSF, where you have a, a whole uh, tent and people guiding you and they give you the, the uh, mask and they guide you. So there are two ways of going about it. Either you dominate the contents through the media or through something a bit more popular, which is YouTube. And that's all from me. Thank you. Gracias, Joan. Uh, y gracias también, Bernat. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Bernat. Just three points, and I shall release you. First of all, we'd like to thank the whole team, the crew on Docs Barcelona, which is led by many wonderful, mostly women. Uh, yeah, we had to talk about women. Uh, they tend to be hidden most of the time. Then we have our keynote speakers, national, international commissioning editors for the interactive pitch tomorrow, members of the meeting point, staff from documentary school, our guests from Doc Barcelona plus Medellin, guests from Colombia, Barcelona Valparaíso, Chile, our magicians from Interactive, which help us out with coding, sponsors such as Europe Creative, Media, Catalonia Music Library, Altair, EGM, Antaviana Films, MSF, Microgest Microgestio, where we have our school technicians such as Noemi, Luca, David, Dani, the translators. Great, thank you. And three people without whom this would not be possible. The head of production of Docs Barcelona, Elena Labart, head of production uh, International, Bea Perez, and our technician, Edith Moget, which has meant we have had not a single technical glitch in eight hours of production. A whole round of applause, applause for them all. A couple of points now. If uh, after this you still want more, we'll see you at the interactive pitch. Here or then at uh, Sexto Maracas and Chihuahua at CCCB. And now, until 7 o'clock, where well, we see the opening ceremony in Aribao, 2,000 people in Docs Barcelona. We have beer and water downstairs. I know we're all exhausted, but we have time for a beer and a chat. This year, it's been absolutely a miracle to be able to do this. I hope we'll be able to do this even better next year. Thank you. <laughs>